A small town prosecuting attorney called his first witness to the stand in a trial, a grandmotherly elderly woman. He approached her and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, well, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy. And frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, you cheat on your wife, you manipulate people and talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a rising big shot when you haven't the brains to realize you will never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. The lawyer was stunned, not knowing what else to do. He pointed across the room and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? And she replied, why, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster, too. I used to babysit him for his parents. And he, too, has been a real disappointment to me. He's lazy, he's bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. The man can't build a normal relationship with anyone, and his law practice is one of the shoddiest in the entire state. Yes, I know him. At this point, the judge wrapped the courtroom to silence and called both counselors to the bench. In a very quiet voice, he said with menace, If either one of you ask her if she knows me, you will be jailed for contempt. (laughs) Our scripture today speaks to us of being in or out of a relationship with God. It speaks to us of someone knowing us well enough to know our character, to know our weaknesses, to know our sins. Just like Mrs. Jones knew these lawyers all too well, God knows our hearts and our actions all too well, just as he knew the hearts and minds and actions of the Israelites during Malachi's time. And because of that, God desires to refine and to transform his people through the Messiah. No matter who we are or what we have done or not done or what we believe or not believe, All of us will face an ultimate judgment with the God of creation. The day of judgment is near. Would you pray with me, please? As I've said before, God, these words of Malachi are extremely hard for us to hear. And so now, Lord God, I ask that you open our minds, open our hearts, to receive your word and the message. And Lord, we ask that we not only hear these things, but we do the things that you have commanded us. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, the cynical Israelites are at it again. They are scornful of the motives and the virtue and the integrity of the divine being they profess to know and love. Listen once again to Malachi. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied God? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or you ask, where is the God of justice? You see, some people are just cynical by nature. They're just plain cranky. I remember a story about a man who had a large, bushy mustache. While he was sleeping, some young pranksters smeared Limburger cheese on his mustache. When he awoke, his first comment was, This room stinks. He immediately went to another room and he pronounced, This house stinks. And then he stepped outside and sniffed and muttered, The whole world stinks. You and I know some people who think the whole world stinks when the real trouble is right beneath their noses. There's not much anyone can do with a person or a group of people who insist on seeing the dark cloud behind every silver lining. And so it was with the Israelites. All cynicism is sad, but one type of cynicism is sadder than all the rest, and that is cynicism towards God. The only one who has never done anything to deserve it. 
And the saddest of all towards God is that which comes from people who profess to know and love him. Malachi is not about to let such complacent cynicism go unchallenged. My, Malachi is about to show the Israelites God's response to their doubt, their distrust, and scorn by jerking them back into reality. So why do the Israelites, or maybe even you, you and I, become cynical towards God? It's because humans tend to construct some notion of what God must do and when he must do it. If it doesn't happen according to our preconceived plan, we conclude that God has failed. Malachi's people are upset with God because in their opinion, he has not corrected things that are crying for attention. And so they let their worship of God suffer, which leads to the decline and suffering of their nation. Their complaint where is the God of justice? It's their way of expressing unhappiness with God for not sending the Messiah. To their minds, the Messiah was long overdue. The Israelites want the coming of the Lord in their time to judge the world. And although God has demonstrated throughout their nation's history that he is faithful to his promises, their faith in him is still shaken. They take God's delay in fulfilling his promise of a Messiah to mean he's not going to keep his promise. So the Israelites think that God has let them down. But Malachi says to the Hebrew people, you have wearied the Lord with your words. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, that, that God gets wearied? <laughs> After all, he ceaselessly watches over creation and works out his purposes without the slightest hint of being exhausted. But what wearies the Lord is putting up with unbelief among his people, with seeing his people persist in sin. If, if you're a parent, you know how God feels. How many times have you said to your son or daughter, how many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? God's impatience and anger are not the same as we may express, but we must recognize that the Lord's weariness with the sin of unbelief rises from the many demonstrations of his trustworthiness and his many warnings about unbelief. And yet we still don't trust God, and many of us still don't truly believe in God. Well, the Israelites believe that God's delay in fulfilling his promise of the Messiah, the one who saves, means that God is not going to keep his promise of sending a Messiah. There are some today who make that same mistake about Christ's second coming. They look at the so-called signs of the time, the, they fix a date, and, and then they get disillusioned when God doesn't come and, and fulfill on that date. Folks, we have to remember that we do not have God's wisdom and that God does not reckon time the way we do. Here's what Peter had to say about it in 2 Peter 3. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, and, and Peter here was talking about the second coming. He says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so verse 17 of chapter 2 is the big setup for God to assure his people in chapter 3 that he has not forgotten his promise and that the Messiah will surely come. Listen again. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming says the Lord of hosts. This messianic verse not only proclaims the coming of the Messiah, but also the special messenger from God who will announce his arrival and whom we now recognize as John the Baptist. 
God even states that the Messiah will visit the newly built temple itself. If you remember, as a small boy, Jesus comes into the temple and teaches there. His presence is in the temple, and God's glory will once again be there. Please notice that, that God refers to the Messiah as the messenger of the covenant. You see, this was the new covenant proclaimed by both Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Listen to God through the prophet Jeremiah, and this is in 627 B.C. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Jeremiah 31. And then this same prophecy is given through the prophet Ezekiel now around 570 B.C. He says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. Ezekiel 37. And now we have this prophecy from Malachi about 400 years before Christ's coming. You see, God is not offering a new plan of salvation with the coming of Jesus Christ. The truth is that God has only one plan of salvation in all of human history, and that plan is Lord Jesus. As we read in the book of Hebrews, the people of the Old Testament era were saved by looking forward in faith to the Messiah's coming. And those since, including you and me, are saved by looking backward in faith to the Christ who has come. But you see, all are saved by faith in Christ. And so verse 1 of chapter 3 brings together three messengers. Malachi was proclaiming God's message of a messenger, John the Baptist, who would precede the greatest of all messengers, Jesus Christ himself. I have no doubt that the hearts of the Israelites were leaping for joy that God had not forgotten his promise, that the Messiah was truly coming. But you see, that joy didn't last too long that the Messiah was truly coming because Malachi delivers a stinging message to the people of Israel in verses 2 through 5. You see, the Messiah's coming would be a day of judgment. The Hebrew people are expecting the Messiah, the Savior, to be a mighty warrior who will deliver them from the hands of their captors, the Persians. But instead, Malachi says the Messiah will be coming to deal with the sins of Israel, not what they were expecting. I like the way the Message Bible translated, writes, but who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He'll be like white hot fire from the smelter's furnace. He'll be like the strongest lye soap at the laundry. He'll take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleanser of dirty clothes. He'll scrub the Levite priests clean, refine them like gold and silver until they're fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. Then and only then will Judah and Jerusalem be fit and pleasing to God as they used to be in years long ago. Furthermore, Malachi continues, the Messiah will come in the capacity of a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, oppressors of the helpless. In other words, the Messiah will not delay in confronting such people with their sins. To state this another way, the coming of the Lord will only bring trouble to those who are in the grip of cynical unbelief. For the Lord will come only to judge and purify them and, and ultimately save them. Malachi's generation did not understand that the coming of the Lord will only be a comfort to those who are ready for it. That is, to those with hearts of faith. They think that when the Lord comes, he will straighten out everyone except his own people. And how wrong they were. We only have to look to the Gospels to see that what God told Malachi and what Malachi told the Hebrew people is right on target. When Jesus came, 
He made no move to overthrow the Roman government and restore Israel to the position she had enjoyed under David and Solomon. Rather, he came calling his own people and the religious leaders to repent and insisting that his kingdom was not of this world. Listen to Matthew 4. <clears throat> From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in John 18, he says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So what does all of this mean for us? It warns us about getting cynical towards God. Such cynicism tires God. It troubles us. Malachi's message also warns us about dictating to God. Many people are doing with Christ's second coming what Malachi's people were doing with his first coming. People are setting dates and detailing all the aspects of Christ's return. If God would not even tell his own son about the time of the second coming, do you really think God has told some of those other charlatans and false prophets? Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone, Mark 13. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to stop all this nonsense about the end of days and knowing the date of Christ's coming. You see, the Israelites yearned for it. The Christians after Jesus' ascension thought it would be soon. And we continue to do the same thing. Instead, we need to concentrate on the real question, and it is this. Are we ready? Are we ready for Christ's return? To put it another way, are our hearts filled with faith? The people of Malachi's time just didn't quite understand, nor do many of us today. You see, the day of judgment is near. The day of judgment is near. When Jesus does return, he'll be looking for the faithful. It will be no different than the first time Jesus was on this earth. He was looking for the faithful. So, are you prepared for the day of judgment? Because nobody knows when it will come, but yet it is always near. If you've not declared Jesus Christ as your Messiah, your Lord and Savior, now is the time. The day of judgment is near. God does not want to judge any of us until all have had a chance to hear the gospel and to choose Christ. And so the Lord said through Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, will not be destroyed. Lord God, let us not be cynical towards you. Let us not set dates and times and expect you to do things and be our vending machine and then say that you failed when, when those things don't happen. So Lord God, let us look on to you in faith. Let us look to your son Jesus Christ as our Savior. Let us have faith in him. And most of all, let us be prepared through our prayers, through our Bible study, through our worship, through our giving, through our service and mission, through our witnessing. Let us be prepared for the day of your coming because the day of judgment is always near. And yet we don't know that time or day. All this we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen.